Jeremy St. Louis, happy to have you along on a Friday, and we are just past the 4 p.m. Eastern time deadline, so that means the NFL's franchise tag deadline is here. Eight players across the league were franchise tagged way back in March. Now, some quickly signed long-term extensions, while others signed their one-year franchise tenders. Uh, Chris Godwin and uh, Cam Robinson signed three-year deals. On the other hand, some players still haven't signed their tenders, and others, like you see the highlight there, Devontae Adams, were traded after being tagged. Now, some players, like these guys, will just opt to play on the franchise tag, or perhaps not, in the case of Jesse Bates. Uh, Dalton Schultz and Mike Kosicki have signed their tenders uh, for 2022. All right, for more on the franchise tag deadline and what it all means, let's bring in CBS Sports senior NFL insider Josina Anderson. Josina, we weren't expecting extensions, and so it comes to pass. So why were there no deals done, and what comes next? Well, each of these cases are individual as far as their negotiations or lack thereof with their respective teams. And we went into this offseason with eight players uh, essentially designated with the tag. The four that you mentioned, obviously not getting it done after uh, the deadline. But when you look at, you know, just kind of quickly going through these situations, particularly with Orlando Brown situation, you know, what I understand there is that obviously, you know, they're not coming to terms and there was uh, an offer made that didn't meet his liking, essentially. Um, from my understanding, you know, there was an offer there for the APY to exceed the market as far as the highest paid at the position, that being uh, Trent Williams, but the guarantees uh, were lacking. When you look at Trent's deal, he has 138 million. His average is at 23.010. That has him at the highest APY. You're looking at another example, like a guy like Ronnie Stanley, who's making less than Trent at 98, but his guarantees are higher than Trent's at 70 and 46. Trent's guarantees are 45 and, and 40, that being the total versus the fully guaranteed, as I know I throw these numbers out. But essentially, to try to make this simple for the audience there, what I understand is that the APY offer was higher than Trent's. The guarantees are pretty much kind of lower than Ronnie's. And even the APY is not a true uh, metric higher than Trent's, because when you add on the extended years, if you're cuttable, before you reach the duration of the contract, then that APY is not really above. So essentially what I'm understanding is that the desire is not to sign a contract that looks flashy, but really in meet when you kind of go over it, doesn't meet what they want to do in terms of truly uh, resetting the market. And then when you look at a guy like uh, Jesse Bates and, and being there for the four years that he has been there and wanting to reset the market, which Minka Fitzpatrick has done at that uh, position uh, with it being at a $72 million contract in uh, 18 um, an 18 APY, Minka Fitzpatrick in that contract got 36 guaranteed. Now the reporting from NFL Network is that um, on the extended deal that the Bengals did offer Jesse, that essentially they were just offering four million more total on what the franchise tag number would be, which is 12. So that gets you to 17. But that 17 gets you well below the guarantee that Minka Fitzpatrick got with 36. So you can see why there is a wide gulf there just in even meeting the mark that Minka got, right? So now that's why you have my reporting, which is what I heard today, that right now the intention is for Jesse Bates not to report at all and uh, not even to play under the franchise tag. So we'll see how they'll resolve that. And with respect, and, and this is the reason why this is important, because when you're looking at the two guys that did not sign their tag deals in Orlando Brown and also in Jesse Bates, the new language under the CBA from 2020 makes it a lot harder to hold out uh, in comparison to years past. So just to go over this really quickly, and I'm going to try to simplify this for your audience right now, just so you understand kind of the decisions for these players. Through the first five days of training camp, you are committing no forfeiture breach, right? They can't come after your money. But when you hit that sixth day, the clubs have the ability to basically uh, take your guaranteed money from that year and uh, tax you, so to speak, up to 50% of that guaranteed money owed for this year. And then every day after that, 
they can come up with an increase of 1% over that 15% each day. And this is over your guaranteed total. It's not like a set fine amount because obviously it's, it's based on how much you make. And that gets capped at 25%. So that is a large amount of money to be thinking about whether you really want to hold out. Because my reporting too is that Orlando Brown right now is weighing his options as to whether he wants to hold, uh, hold out after not meeting uh, an agreement, you know, per this deadline today. And then lastly, just so your audience understands, when you get to the regular season, if you miss that first game, okay, they can they can go after another 25% on that 25%. And then if you go beyond four games, then you're subject to total forfeiture. So the box in that these players have is way more significant, although collectively bargained, than in years past previously uh, to 2020. And then when you're looking at the other tight ends, and Dalton Schwartz and, and Mike uh, Gesicki, um, you know, basically, you know, both of those players pretty much had career years, but they're not able to, you know, meet their numbers relative to what they were trying to reach. And both of them obviously are okay going forth without uh, consummating a long-term deal today. All right. There are other players that are looking for extensions, Josina. <laughs> a couple of notable quarterbacks on that list and Lamar Jackson and Kyler Murray. Where do we stand with those extension discussions? So we know per what Lamar Jackson has said when he reported for mandatory camp uh, that there is conversations or that there are conversations going on with the team. We'll see if they can get that done uh, before they report. I think when you're looking at the amount that Lamar Jackson is uh, likely looking for, right now there's seven quarterbacks that make over $40 million a year. Um, you're looking at Aaron Rodgers at the top of that, I believe with the average of uh, 50.3. I don't think it's uh, unrealistic for Lamar Jackson just relative to the market and how how the cap goes up each year and inflation and all those other considerations to be seeking more. I'm not saying that he is, but I'm saying that I don't think it's uh, hard to understand if he is to be above what Patrick Mahomes makes at 46 million a year and then maybe slot obviously below, right? Aaron Rodgers may be looking for something between 46 and 50 is what I would surmise. Um, but right now they're still having those talks and, and we'll see if they'll get it done. Uh, you know, the sources, every time I talk to them, everyone keeps talking about how sensitive, you know, the situation is and you can understand that relative to how the situation is being has been dealt with up to this point before he reported and with Kyler Murray I think you know what I've heard talking to sources is that you know it's not uh, unrealistic for them to try to get this deal done for him that being a long-term deal before training camp we'll see if it actually gets done I think what we're looking for with that contract is to see where it slots among the quarterbacks, among those seven that I mentioned that are making above that threshold, threshold rather, 40 million and above. Is he making more than Dak at 40 million? Is he making more than Derek Carr at 40 million? And then you start to get above and, and where does he slot in there? That's probably, you know, uh, obviously what they're trying to figure out. But the expectation right now is that it's uh, probable that it will happen, but we'll have to wait to see if it's fully, fully done before uh, camp. And it's been an interesting offseason between the Cardinals and their quarterback, Kyler Murray. So certainly uh, some stuff to keep an eye on there. All right, some players, Josina, still looking for teams to play for in 2022. We have a list here of some of the notable free agents that are still on the market. Uh, what are you hearing about potential landing spots uh, for some of these players? Well, I mean, obviously, you're, you're, when you're looking at a player like OBJ, you're not expecting that to get done until we get, you know, closer into the meat of the season as he uh, starts to rehab his uh, ACL. And you're looking at the impact of attrition over the course of the season and what teams need not only a, a wide receiver, but also one that, uh, you know, showed his impact, objectively speaking, in the first half of, of the Super Bowl. Uh, you know, when you're talking about uh, Kyle Rudolph uh, and the conversation, you know, there have been reports out there that the Vikings are potentially looking at him or what have you. We'll see if that happens. Uh, and Dominican Sue, through reports, has been linked to, uh, you know, the Raiders and the Browns. It's my reporting that that's not the case uh, uh, as we speak. Uh, not saying that any of these players are not formidable to be uh, bringing up a market, but these things are fluid and day to day. And pretty much, especially when you get this far into the season, arise upon need. 
you know, or relative to attrition and these clubs having the opportunity to evaluate their clubs once they get into uh, a training camp. Uh, some of there's so there's some other notable players out there like KJ Wright, uh, Landon Collins, and, and and players like that that are still waiting to just have the market uh, come to fruition relative to the things I just said with how the clubs uh, evaluate their teams once we get into camp. Yeah, sometimes it might take getting into training camp and seeing how bodies measure out uh, before some of these guys start finding new homes. Uh, mm -hmm. We're still awaiting the decision for the Deshaun Watson punishment from the NFL. Uh, Justina, just give us an update on where things stand right now. So right now, the jointly appointed arbitrator, Sue Robinson, um, has gotten the post-hearing briefs in uh, that were, uh, per the CBA, only supposed to be five pages, single space. And a lot of people have made a lot about that relative to the time they feel like it should take for her to come to a decision. But that's really where we are now, waiting for Sue Robinson to go over those post-hearing briefs, uh, come up with her decision, make a written decision, make it well-founded as to why she is coming up with that, and then go from there. Obviously, people understand right now that if she, for some reason, determines that there has not uh, been a violation per the personal conduct policy, then uh, Roger Goodell nor any designee has the ability to change anything uh, after that. If she determines that there is a violation, obviously, then it kicks into uh, Roger Goodell's lap or his designee um, with the interim being whether either side would like to pursue uh, an appeal relative to whatever uh, violation she would deem at that point. So that's what we are, are waiting for here. Uh, some of the other reporting that I've had in this interim uh, relative to the NFL's investigation is that we know that the NFL came into this process uh, having, linked, at least per our understanding, having interviewed uh, uh, 12 women. And then uh, from there, five women were a part of what they were focusing on uh, coming into this hearing. And then I have reported over the last few days that we know at issue right now, there are four women after one of those women, uh, per our understanding, um, was their desire to have it included in the investigation from a, a media report. And I had also heard that too, and I know Pro Football Talk put that out, out there as well. And so right now that has dwindled us from uh, five to four. And essentially, uh, just to include in that lastly, when trying to deem if there is a violation, one of the things that also makes this very difficult so people understand out there is that the language in the personal conduct policy is, is very uh, vague and very broad. And so what that means is that it is subject to subjectivity relative to whether uh, Sue Robinson deems that Deshaun Watson has impacted the integrity of the shield, whether their uh, behavior can be deemed in any way as irresponsible. Now, where the complexity comes in is that also in that same personal conduct policy, it says that owners are to be held to a higher standard. And we can definitely have a debate when you look at uh, some of the controversy that uh, Patriots owner Robert Kraft has been, uh, uh, Daniel Snyder, what have you, whether that uh, metric of being held to a higher standard was met when it comes to owners um, and whether there's been any disparate discipline given out to the players in comparison. And of course, there was the 30 lawsuits that were settled against the Houston Texans today, which uh, may factor into that as well. She is CBS Sports senior NFL insider Justina Anderson joining us to update us on the Deshaun Watson situation and discuss the franchise tag deadline, which passed in the NFL today. Thanks, Josina. Great to see you as always. Great work as usual. We are approaching 50 days away from the 2022 NFL season kicking off. 55 days uh, to be exact as of today. And we have everything covered for you here on CBS Sports HQ in the lead up to the season and when it gets underway on CBS on September the 11th. You can also stream the games on Paramount+. Plus. Do you want a sports network that delivers everything that matters about the game? The highlights, the picks, the instant analysis, no yelling, no fake debates, no politics. Hit the subscribe button and never miss a moment.